Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in. Uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road. And we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. We have been in a series on the blessings that Jacob spoke to each of his 12 sons. And these 12 sons, as we have said, were the fathers of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And as Jacob was about to pass on to die, he assembled his 12 sons together. And under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he gave each son a prophetic blessing. And so far, we have looked at Reuben and Simeon. Levi and Zebulun, Issachar, Gad, Asher, Dan, Naphtali, Joseph, Judah, and Benjamin. So we are bringing this series to a close as we look at Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, born to him by his Egyptian wife while he was living in Egypt. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we, we looked at how Pharaoh being the high priest of the Egyptian religion, most likely saw fit to have Joseph married into a priestly family, seeing that Joseph would become second in command under Pharaoh with the title Zephaneph Pania. As scripture states, Joseph's father Jacob adopted Manasseh and Ephraim as his own which gave them the right to be the leaders of the tribes that bear their names. And throughout Scripture, the tribe of Joseph is, is given in reference to the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. And together, these two tribes make up the tribe of Joseph. Now, the tribe of Manasseh descended through Manasseh's son, uh, Machar. And during their first 430 years in Egypt, the tribe of Manasseh increased to 32,200 men of war. By the second census, 39 years later, it numbered 52,700. The tribe of Ephraim descended through Ephraim's son, Shutulia. And during their first 430 years in Egypt, the tribe of Ephraim numbered 40,500. And at the second census, they had decreased to 32,500. The tribes of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Benjamin were all located together on the west side of the tabernacle. And in the settlement of Canaan, land was provided for Manasseh on both sides of the Jordan River. The half of this tribe, along with Reuben and Gad, had their territory assigned them by Moses on the east of the Jordan. The portion given to the half-tribe of Manasseh was the largest on the east side of the Jordan, containing 60 cities, 60. On the west of Jordan, the other half of the tribe of Manasseh was associated with Ephraim, and they had their portion in the very center of Palestine, an area of about 1,300 square miles, abounding in springs of water. Manasseh's portion was immediately to the north of that of Ephraim. And you can see that in Joshua chapter 16. Now the tribes of Dan and Benjamin were to the south and the tribes of West Manasseh was to the north. The tribe of Manasseh was known for its valor and it produced two judges, Gideon and Japheth. And furthermore, during Saul's reign, men of Manasseh joined David at Ziglag. And later, many people from both the western and eastern Manasseh rallied to make David king at Hebron. The tribe of Ephraim produced Deborah, the prophetess in the times of Judges, Joshua, and the prophet Samuel. The blessing that Moses spoke concerning the tribe of Joseph are fulfilled in his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. In Deuteronomy 33, 13 and 7, Moses said this about uh, Joseph. He said, May the Lord bless his land with the precious dew from heaven above and with the deep waters that lie below with the best the sun brings forth and the finest the moon can yield, with the choicest gifts of the ancient mountains and the fruitfulness of the everlasting hills, 
with the best gifts of the earth and its fullness and favor of him who dwelt in the burning bush. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. In majesty, he is like a firstborn bull. His horns are the horns of a wild ox. And with them, he will gore the nations, even those at the ends of the earth. Such are the ten thousands of Ephraim. Such are the thousands of Manasseh. So this brings us to our four, first point this morning, that the tribe of Ephraim had the distinct honor of having the center of Israel's religious worship in Shiloh. The tribe of Ephraim had the distinct honor of having the center of Israel's religious worship in Shiloh. In Joshua 18.1, it says, The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. It's the tabernacle, where they would place the ark. When Moses died, Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim, whose faith and courage had been distinguished among the spies, succeeded Moses as leader of Israel. And Jacob, Jacob's blessing concerning Ephraim as being greater than his brother is seen in its distinct privilege of possessing the tent of meaning, the tabernacle dwelling within the city of Shiloh, which was in their territory. Therefore, fulfilling the prophetic blessing of Moses. In Joshua 14, or 1947, these are the territories that Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel assigned by lot at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord at the entrance to, to the tent of the meeting. And so they finished dividing the land. So point number two is that the tribe of Ephraim had the distinct honor of having God's presence revealed in Shiloh through the prophet Samuel. Not only did, was the tent of meeting right there as the, as the uh, religious center of worship in Shiloh, but uh, they also had a, a prophet by the name of Samuel. So God's presence would be revealed. His words would be revealed. It says the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he would reveal himself to Samuel through his word. So they've got the presence of God, and they've got the voice of God. From the beginning of life in Palestine, the tribe of Ephraim enjoyed a certain prestige and honor because of the Lord's presence, his word, and his power. But that would not be enough to keep this tribe or the other tribes from being led into captivity because of their constant rebelliousness and sinfulness and forgetting the Lord and serving other gods. Their false religious practices would lead them in the lifestyles of wickedness, even though they had God's presence and his word and his power right there in Shiloh. As the tribes of Israel indulged in the sinful practices around them, the prophet Isaiah spoke prophetically about what would happen to the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. And what is witnessed and all that was happening to the tribes is that, letter A, sin is its own punishment. Sin is its own punishment. Isaiah 9, 18, 8, Surely wickedness burns like a fire. Surely wickedness burns like a fire. Sin's its own punishment. The sin and wickedness of the people is pictured as burning them up like a huge fire with a large column of smoke. Sin burns as a fire and consumes everything in its path. There are 36 references in the book of Hosea that speak about Ephraim. Hosea 5.5, 5, Israel's arrogance testifies against them. The Israelites, even Ephraim, stumble in their sin. They stumble in their sin. 8.11 says, though Ephraim built many altars for sin offerings, these have become altars for sinning. In 11.12, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, the house of Israel with deceit. And in 13.12, the guilt of Ephraim is stored up. His sins are kept on record. As you can see, the people of Ephraim, who were once strong and prosperous over time, became unfruitful. Isaiah 9.18b says, It consumes briars and thorns. It sets the forest thickets ablaze so that it rolls upward in a column of smoke. Briars is wild growth of weeds. Thorns are, are a token of a wasteland. 
figurative of a hardened heart. Hosea 13, 1 and 2 says, When Ephraim spoke, men troubled. They trembled. He was exalted in Israel, but he became guilty of Baal worship and died. Now they sin more and more. When you continue with the prophet Isaiah, he says, By the wrath of the Lord Almighty, the land will be scorched and the people will be fuel for the fire. The wrath of the Lord Almighty, by his wrath, the land will be scorched and the people will be fuel for the fire. See, even in Old Testament times, God hated sin and he hates it now and he'll hate it and judge it in the future. In 2 Samuel 23, 6 and 7, but evil men are all to be cast aside like thorns which are not gathered with the hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool of iron or the shaft of a spear, and they are burned up while they lie, where they lie. There is strong irony in representing those who once lifted themselves up in pride and wickedness being now in just retribution made to lift themselves up as volumes of ascending smoke while they're being consumed. You see, let it be, judgment would come from the Lord in enemy nations and from within. Judgment would come from the Lord, enemy nations, and from within. Isaiah continues, no one will spare his brother. On the right, they will devour, but still be hungry. On the left, they will eat, but not be satisfied. Each will feed on the flesh of his own offspring. Manasseh will feed on Ephraim, and Ephraim on Manasseh. Together, they will turn against Judah. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. Again, Hosea. But Ephraim has bitterly provoked him to anger. His, his Lord will leave him, will leave upon him the guilt of his bloodshed and will repay him for his contempt. Psalm 106, 43. Many times he delivered them, but they were bent on rebellion and they wasted away in their sins. What is sad is that the nation would destroy itself by its own wickedness. People would oppose each other, devour each other, and even entire tribes would be in conflict. And as we bring this series to a close, there's some very important spiritual measures that can be gleaned from the tribes of Israel. 1 Corinthians 10, 6, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. This is Paul speaking to the church in his second letter to the Corinthian church. And he's saying that all these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. With this as our school of thought, I want to bring your attention to some profound details that clarify the tribe of Ephraim that are written in Psalm 78. But what we need to keep in mind is that the psalmist is using Ephraim as a representation of the apostasy of the whole nation of Israel. But I also want to take this a step further and apply this to all who profess to be Christians today. And the first thing we notice is this, number three, the Lord has given his true disciples, true disciples, the distinction of being fully armed for spiritual battle. The Lord has given his true, and I say true disciples because the word Christian can mean a lot of different things today. But the Lord has given his true disciples 
The distinction of being fully armed for spiritual battle. Psalm 78, 9a, the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows. Like the tribe of Ephraim, disciples of Jesus have been fully armed for spiritual battle. The tribe of Ephraim had the tabernacle of God in their midst. And because of that, they had the Lord's presence, his word, and his power. And this separated them with distinction and honor and privilege. You see, the true disciple of Jesus has the distinct privilege of having the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. The true disciple of Jesus has the privilege of knowing God's presence, of knowing his word and his power in their life. In fact, the words being used in in this point, fully armed, are embodied right here in these verses. Peter says in his second epistle, his divine power, God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, the holy nature of God and escape the corruption of in the world caused by evil desires. And Paul says to the church at Corinth in his first letter, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. What's he mean by that? Well, we don't lack any spiritual gift. We've been given everything we need for life and godliness by the divine power of God as we're waiting for the rapture of the church, the coming of Christ. And Paul continues, he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. He's faithful. We have the distinct honor and privilege as true disciples of Jesus to experience God's presence to experience his word being spoken to us and to experience his power. This brings us to point four. The Lord has given his true disciples the distinction of being fully armed so that they will not turn back in the day of battle. Not turn back when, when things get crazy. Not turn back when the trials come. Not turn back when the persecution comes. In Psalm 78, 9b, the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows. Look at, listen to this now. Turn back in the day of battle. They turn back. In what ways did the tribes of Israel turn back? Well, you look into 10, verse 10. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them marvelous things he did in their sight, in the sight of their fathers, in the the land of Egypt, and in the field of Zon. Like their fathers, they were disloyal, faithless, and unreliable as a faulty bow. They angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. And when God heard them, he was very angry. He rejected Israel completely. He abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh in the tent he had set up among men. Remember, Ichabod, glory has departed. What does a true disciple of Jesus do to prevent themselves from turning back in the day of spiritual battle? Well, I'm going to give you a few things here. True disciples of Jesus do not turn back in the day of spiritual battle when they are devoted, letter A, when they are devoted to the promises of God. Remember Simeon who was devout. He he took hold well and stood on the promises of the Lord. Also a true disciple of Jesus, he will not turn or she will not turn back in the day of spiritual battle when they walk in truth righteousness and are a testimony to the world when they they won't turn back 
when they walk in truth and do not turn back in the day of spiritual battle. Letter B says, they walk in truth, righteousness, and are a testimony to the world. John's third epistle, he says, it gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Twice he says that. Actually, three times. Faithfulness to the truth, walk, continuing to walk in the truth, and then again, walking in the truth. Not twisting scripture to meet your evil desires. Not watering down the word of God. Not replacing it. Not rejecting it. But walking in the truth of it. The truth that leads to righteousness and holiness. True disciples of Jesus Do not turn back in the day of spiritual battle when, let us see, they preserve in prayer regardless of the outcome. When they persevere in prayer regardless of the outcome. In Isaiah 37, 14 and 15, Hezekiah was was given a letter by Sennacherib. king of Assyria. Basically telling him that, that God has sent him to judge. And he surrounded the city. And in that letter is a list of lies. A list of compromise. And it says right here, Isaiah 37, 14 and 15. That letter, that the king wanted Hezekiah to surrender the city. And it says, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. And then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. He took that letter, that evil email, and spread it out on the altar. And he prayed. He basically said, Lord, this is against you. These things are being said about you and about your people. There are times where we need to take what we're going through, maybe write it down, and spread it out in your prayer closet and offer it up to God. True disciples of Jesus, they don't turn back in the day of spiritual battle when, D, they refuse to be isolated and they stay connected through fellowship. When they refuse to be isolated and stay connected through fellowship. Acts 2, 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer, the four T's. Togetherness, teaching, table, throne. True disciples of Jesus not tuned back in the day of spiritual battle when E, they love one another with actions and truth. When they love one another in actions and truth. And you know, when, when the love stops, then that's when the isolation begins. That's when there's a break in fellowship. When people get hurt, they build walls. And part of the wall building is, well, I just, you know, let's just stay away from church. I get it. I don't have that option. As a pastor, there's been times I've been hurt. There's been times I've had some wicked emails sent to me. And I've had to spread them out before the Lord. But I don't have the option to just say, you know what? I'm not going to go to church. I still have to come. I still have to face those people. 
I still have to love because that's what we're called to do. But I've watched people, they get into it and they, they don't keep short accounts and they war against each other and they, they scatter rather than gather. And they make up excuses and they blame leadership and off they go and then do the same thing. Church after church after church. And the world looks on and wonders, why would I want to go there? Where's the power? Where's the obedience to the word? Where's the transformation? No. True disciples, when spiritual battle comes, and unfortunately sometimes it happens when other believers are doing the work of the enemy rather than the work of God. And people resolve conflict through forgiveness. And it's not just believers. Obviously, it's the world. But Paul said to the church at Colossae, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Let me say that again. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Lord, how do we pray? And Jesus answered, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's simple enough. Is that to the point? Where to forgive? Keep short accounts. Not become like the tribes of Israel that war against each other. And true disciples of Jesus do not turn back in the day of spiritual battle when, gee, they intentionally remember the Lord. Intentionally remember the Lord. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 8.11, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. Don't forget him. Forgetting the Lord is the same as neglecting him. And the true disciple of Jesus will never turn their back in the day of spiritual battle because they will never turn their back from the truth. If they do, in essence, they're forgetting the Lord. Even when times are difficult because of the trials and tests of life, true disciples of Jesus remember the Lord's love, his faithfulness, and his goodness. They will not turn back in the day of spiritual battle because they never forget the goodness of God. Even when times are good and everything is prosperous and great, they refuse to forget the Lord who's blessed them. A true disciple of Jesus will always be walking in the truth and will not turn back in the day of spiritual battle because they never forget the Lord by teaching their children and their children's children the knowledge of the Lord. Listen to the first part of Psalm 70 and understand that this is the prophetic blessing given to men so that when applied, they will never turn their backs in the day of spiritual battle. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. Telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. That the generation to come might know him. The children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments 
may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Therefore, remember this, letter H. Being a true disciple of Jesus who is walking in the truth means that every day, every day is a spiritual battle. And courage is kept alive by zealous action. Being intentional about serving God. Being intentional about loving him. Being intentional about hearing from him through his word. Being intentional about fellowship. Being intentional about keeping short accounts with one another. Being intentional about the unity. Being intentional about giving of yourself to others in service. Being intentional about making the most of every opportunity by giving a reason for the faith that you believe. You see, true religion brings with it a courageous heart. And Dr. South has well said that since Christ has made a Christian course a warfare, of all men living a coward is the most unfit to make a Christian. And yet it is mournful to think that of the great army of Christians who enroll themselves under the banner of the cross in baptism and confirmation and who wear the uniform and carry the sword of a Christian soldier. So many resemble the ill-starred men of Ephraim who being armed and carrying bows turn themselves back in the day of battle. Courage can only be kept alive by zealous action. J.N. Norton says, we can readily imagine a gallant regiment riding into the valley of death at a dashing gallop, but it would be Simply absurd to picture them crawling in a snail's page towards the expectant foe, coolly calculating the chances of a disastrous defeat. As Christians, we profess to be engaged in a warfare against something, even the enemies of our salvation, the world, the flesh, and the devil, three most formidable and deadly foes. The church is engaged in open and determined war. We can all well afford to do good service for Christ and his kingdom since the end draws near. Here is the battlefield in the land of the sword and the spear. There already in sight to the eye of faith in the triumphal procession of the conquerors in the land of the wreath and the crown. May you never forget who you are in Christ. May you never forget how distinguished and honored and blessed you are to have the presence and the word and the power of God not around you, in you. And may you never run or retreat from the battle. The war is unseen, but the battle is real. But we have the weapon. The weapon. The word of God. The presence of God. The power of God. You don't fight this spiritual war with conventional weapons. We fight it spiritually. And as scripture says, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus.